Hello sound as ever people. Uh, recently we caught up with the wonderful Adelita for podcast number two in the sound as ever series of podcasts. Um, we asked her a lot of questions as uh, forwarded and asked by you. Um, and we also did a podcast uh, basically an A to Z of the 90s from Go to Woe for Magic Dirt. Um, that will be uploaded really soon but we thought we'd um, pop this video of Adelaide answering your questions with thanks to the Thornbury Theatre, Neil Wedd and Peter Bain Hogg. Enjoy. Got some questions for you from the oh. Sound as Ever page. Awesome. So uh, I'm going to ask the questions here. First uh, question, Joshua Nash asks, will the 90s classic uh, Young and Full of the Devil get the reissue treatment? Oh, everybody's asking that question. You reissued um, yes. Life, Science, Science, Science and Life. Life, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Recently, yeah. and they went that's really right. well. Yeah, yeah. Look, um, I can't give you any scoops, Joshua, and I appreciate the question though. Um, am I looking down the barrel too or is it just Jane? I am. Oh, I'm looking down the barrel. Um, look, uh, just stay tuned on that front and we hopefully will have some news for you at some point. But All right. Cheers. Fingers crossed. Fingers yeah. crossed. Yeah. Uh, Craig Camber, mm. uh, uh, an, mm. an old name and face from, Hi, from Craig. the 90s. Hi, Craig. <laughs> Uh, he wants to know, memories of the Punners Club, the Tote or other fave Melbourne venues? We kind of covered the Tote off yeah. uh, in our chat, but feel free. Oh, look, so many memories and hazy ones, um, drunken ones. I was drunk a lot of the time at those shows, can't remember much. I remember getting carried out of the Punners Club at one point. <laughs> I had like a blood head and I was in the ladies' toilets How did really that happen? drunk. I don't know, really drunk and I must have hit something and I got carried out. I got banned from the Punters Club for one night. I, and I was doing – and Magic Bear were doing a show, so we got banned. Uh, uh, <laughs> I got show. banned. Yeah, banned from my own show. Uh, Prince of Wales, I remember – oh, Neil Wedd's here today. I remember we – and Neil, Neil and I were um, – Reminiscing about the time I broke the mirror in the dressing room in the Prince of Wales, I was, as I said, all fired up and angry at the got belled and ah, I really pissed. Ah, ah, break the mirror, and he's like, "Oh my god!" So I got banned from there for a night. Um, <laughs> lots of great gig memories, you know. Punters Club. I remember the night when um, we f f we found out Kurt Cobain had died, and we had a show on at the Punters Club, like. The, that oh, night, wow. I think, or the night after. So I remember smoking a doobie and I was like, oh, no, really? Oh. So I remember that. Um, yeah, lots, so many great memories. Are you one of these performers that feels you perform better drunk or at least with a few <laughs> drinks in you? <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes it's not good. Sometimes it's not good. Bit of Dutch courage, yeah, we all do that. S still do it. Um, some of the greatest shows that Magic Dirt has ever done has been when we've been absolutely smashed. <laughs> well, we think so anyway, but maybe. <laughs> but the audience was absolutely smashed too. So we were kind of, we actually, we did this great show at Ruby's Lounge, the old Ruby's Lounge, not there anymore, yeah. out in Belgrave. Yeah, yeah. And um, the whole, and it was around the time of, I think it was the Howard government and, you know, they were really shitty, doing shitty things and everyone, everyone was protesting and, we had a gig that night and we were all like, fuck Howard, fuck the fuck it. And um, everyone was smashed. Everyone. The band, the audience. And it was the best night. The best <laughs> night. <laughs> we trashed all our gear and drinks. But, um, yeah, some of the biggest shows, you know, big day outs, you know, you have a couple of Dutch Courage drinks to get up there. But you have to be a bit good to do a good show. You have to, you know. But now I'm old. Oh, I can't. If I get really drunk now, it's just a shit show. <laughs> <laughs> But oh well, you know. Next question is from Lauren Connolly. How does it feel reuniting after such a long time and getting such an amazing reception? Yeah, it feels really good. Like just all the love from the crowd and, you know, um, we've been doing signings at these big events, you know, at Signing 10 and we meet everyone and people are in tears. Like which sets us off too and it's like it's just so lovely to see everyone and they love it. Like... Yeah, you just don't know what to expect. You don't know what is going to happen. But the reaction has been unreal and people love it. And we're kind of all in the same age group. We're all like, oh, in our 40s, kind of rocking on. We're going to fucking rock out. You know, and it's great. But there's young people. It's nice to see younger people. And, and um, but, yeah, it's it's it was kind of weird at the start, really weird and hard and, you know, without Dean. and But we just know that Dean would want us to do this. So it feels like we're – so the – the other feeling is we feel really good to be doing it, you know, 
in and, his honour. And it's and it's you're reliving Dean every time you play exactly. those songs, you know. Exactly. So we feel cl- closer to him, even closer to him doing these. So it's been unreal. You're tough. It's 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 pretty cool. Yeah. Isn't it funny though? When you know when you were going through your tough times, you know, in the band. Isn't it funny to hear back at you that all these people were just connecting with your music and you were changing lives through your music and providing a soundtrack to their youth? Yeah, I know. Yeah, we get so many people, you know, it has changed their lives and still to this day, you know, um, in many ways, you know, through the music and, yeah, like really profound stories. Like you just go, oh, well, didn't know we'd help in that way, you know, saving people's lives. Even. Really? People yeah. have said you've saved their lives. Yeah. 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 Pretty hardcore. Far. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, music yeah, has such a beneficial effect. Mm. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, down the road. Clint Hargraves. Hello, Clint. Wants to know, what's Daniel Herring doing these days? Uh, Daniel, um, he still makes music... Um, and I keep um, pestering him to release what he's doing. But he he has a big collection of pedals. He's got great guitars. He He's still making music but just not in a public forum. Um, so hopefully one day um, his music is sees the light of day and gets out there. So, yeah, maybe send him a message somehow. <laughs> Aaron Curran says, what are your favourite memories of working and hanging out with the late, great Roland S. Howard? Oh, that's a nice question. Yeah, Roland was really cool. He was such a lovely guy. We're really lucky we got to work with him. Dean actually really was spearheaded that whole thing. Dean was a huge fan of Roland's. So in that way, in that connection, I became a huge fan of Roland's as well. What were you, What did you guys work on together? So we worked on around Circa What A Rock Stars Doing Today. We released a bonus disc which contains a bunch of songs we were working on at the time at um, Birdland, which had moved, and we involved Roland in those songs. And Roland was kind of doing his solo thing, uh, I think it was around just before Teenage Snuff Film or when people weren't really going, seeing him a lot and, like, he wasn't getting as much support. So we really wanted to support him at the time and, you know, involve him and, you know... um, um, pay him for his time you know we wanted to support him Mm. and so that's how we got him involved um in our songs and we you know obviously loved his guitar work and um it was just beautiful we just put him in the room and he just made this incredible sound beautiful melodies over the top of our music and we're just like we can't believe this and then a few years later he came and did a cover of a song i'd co co-written with Joe McKee from Snowman called Summer High. Um, we got Roland in at that point. It was, I think it was around 2008 maybe even. And Roland was really sick at that time when we had him in the studio. But he just somehow, he just played this beautiful guitar and sang beautifully even though he was like really ill. And he was so cute. He like, the only thing he kind of asked for was a can of Coke. <laughs> It was just like he was such a beautiful man, like the most nicest, friendliest dude, like but this kind of icon, like mm. this legend, you know. But when you meet him, he was just so sweet. <laughs> um, he probably wouldn't want me revealing that he's so, you know, whatever. <laughs> but, you know, he's a tough man. He's cool, yeah. <laughs> but no, he was just lovely. This is a really interesting one. I was going to ask this at the end, but it's come next in the in the queue. Richard Lawrence sent Richard Lawrence asks, for all your contributions to Australian music, what would you most like to be remembered for? Oh, oh that's an interesting question. What what would I most like to be remembered for? Um, I think just maybe doing things my own way and um, uh, being authentic, I guess, or just. Um, just oh I had it then and it escaped my head um just kind of anyone can do it kind of thing like don't worry about following any rules I guess just the DIY aspect I guess just just do what you want to do um and go for it and don't think too much about it and 
just follow your heart or something. I think it's just be those sort of values. Yeah, just yeah. be true to yourself and follow your heart. Just, yeah, and just do what you want to do. I think I'd want to be remembered for those sort of things. I, yeah. I, I imagine the person that tells you what to do is the person that gets told to fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty much that's me. Yeah, I get pretty fired up. <laughs> Um, All right, Michael Waser next I'm sure Dean once told me you guys recorded a cover of Tumbleweed's Daddy Longlegs What happened to it? Dean also called the last chords the heaviest in rock and roll (laughs) Oh man, Magic Dirt are such massive Tumbleweed fans Like we toured with those guys a lot and we loved them so much and we really looked up to those guys. And Daddy Longlegs, when we saw that on Rage or because we did or wherever we saw it, we were just like, whoa. Or we must have seen it live when they played it live because we did tour a lot. And, yeah, those chords are incredible at the end. Oh, my God, <laughs> I love it. Whenever it comes on now, I still go nuts. But, uh, no, we never did a cover of it. So I don't – that's one of those Chinese whispers, I think. Yeah, No. That oh, is not true. We not would never true. attempt a cover of that song. No way. No. Never too late. No, no. It is, no, <laughs> no, can't top it. That's the, that's the version. Uh, another question about recording from Jonathan Miller. Were you guys ever doing a split with Jebediah? I know they covered Pace It for a compilation of theirs and they were covering oh. Redhead uh, at one point. Um, is this true? Oh, no. I don't think we did. But, again, Jebediah, like, Big mates of ours. We did lots of tours with them. Did a show at the the Grosvenor in Perth one time, and we played a practical joke on them. We got some costumes from a local costume hire place, and Dean was dressed as a German, like a little a German girl with lederhosen or something. I was dressed <laughs> as a clown. No, uh, I don't know. No, no. Dean was dressed as a as a Roman like gladiator. We we're all dressed up, and we got got out on stage and basically just ran a muck during their set. Um, but I think they did do a, pa- a cover of "Pace It." Right. Yeah. Did you wear these costumes on stage? Yeah. During Jebediah's set, we right. wore these magic dirt, wore these different <laughs> costumes, and got up and <laughs> ran a muck on stage. So yeah, we have lots of good memories with the Jebs. <laughs> Um, oh, the one and only Barry Devola has oh, submitted a question. Hello. I remember seeing Magic Dirt support pavement at Max's in Petersham in 1993 and the room was full of A&R guys eyeing each other off, all trying to sign the band. I'd love to hear Adelita reveal all the crazy things record companies did or promised to do in order to tempt the band to sign on the dotted line back then and why they said no. That is a fantastic question, Barry. <laughs> I'm sure you were promised the world. <laughs> yeah, look, um, I'm sure other members of the band were more um, privy to all that stuff, whereas I don't have much of a memory of it because I was very much in my own bubble and I didn't get involved that much with that side of things. So I can't give you any details, but I do remember things like them wanting to take us out for drinks and to restaurants, a lot of restaurant sort of things. And I definitely didn't want to do that. I was like, oh, that's creepy. I don't want to go to the restaurant with these old guys. You know, so (laughs) there was a lot of that. There was lots of big figures. I remember that. I can't Mm. can't remember the the actual numbers but Mm. like big figures and Mm. things like that. Because they were all trying to outdo each other, out-check each other with their checkbook. I yeah. remember. Yeah. And it wasn't just your, your band, it was Tumbleweed, you know, it was, yeah. it was Jebediah, it was any band that were on the, on, the, on the rise. Yeah, so there was a lot of Americans in the audience checking us out and stuff like that, which I didn't know exactly who they were, but, um, yeah, I remember, I remember that. Um, Did you get stuff delivered to your house, from, <laughs> from, you know, with thanks, <laughs> with compliments? Yeah, yeah. Not that I know of, uh, right. but I, I, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think it got to that stage. Um, yeah. Mm. All right. Thank you, Barry. Greg De Niro. This is a strange one. Do you like Julia Jacqueline yourself? Julia and others, of course, have shaped Aussie music, I reckon. You rock. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, Julia Jacqueline is... She's amazing. She's got such a beautiful voice and 
I didn't, I've heard a couple of her songs and, um, yeah, she's she's awesome. Yeah, there's so many great, um, you know, musicians out there that I love that are doing stuff at the moment um, and, yeah, it's good to see. I know you were you, you said you said during the interview that you were always a tomboy uh, and you know you were always one of the boys but were there any during the 90s were there any women you gravitated to or that you had long lasting friendships with in the in the music biz or in b- other bands It's really funny I I can't there were there were not there were hardly any girls in music at the time So no I didn't really I have someone there that I, no no, I, if there were girls in bands, but they were in different cities, so mm. that you you only ever meet up during gigs and stuff like that. Um, and in my hometown, I think there was like maybe a couple of girls in other bands, but they weren't in the same peer group as me, so I didn't really hang out with them. Um, I guess one of the first women I remember was Linda Johnson from um, Little Ugly Girls, the Tasmanian um, mm, yeah. punk band. Yeah. And I really looked up to her and we still have a friendship now. But she was one of the first um, women that I really gravitated towards and there was a friendship, um, but she lived in Tassie. Um, so she was one of the first. Wow. But, um, yeah, but, you know, people like Sarah McLeod from Super Jesus and Skulker and Spit of Hurt and, you know, I'm trying to remember and Night of Chris and all those Chris, bands, yeah. you know, that we'd meet up at shows and, you know, we'd be like, oh, finally get to hang out with some chicks. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. So that was really nice, you know, mm. um, and have a nice day, you know, yeah. in bands like that. Um, but, yeah, in my peer group and no, no, there wasn't. So when did that change for you? When did you start forming? I mean, I know you said you had some of those French, but when did that change for you? When did you start, I guess, having having women as as best friends? Yeah, it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> like, it <laughs> You know, I reckon um, in the mid 2000s, um, when maybe rock was kind of tapering off a bit, and there was more like the gentler kind of music coming in, and I made some friends in that way in different genres of mm. music, mm. Um, and we still have friendships to this day. And, and and more and more as time has gone on, I have a wider, I have a more wider concentrated group of women musicians now that um is really nice and um there's a lot more women i think it's fair to now. say too the scene uh supports women a lot more yeah it didn't used to back in the 90s yeah 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 i reckon i reckon you're right which leads us to our next question from jas jas Fu. uh how bad was sexual harassment assault throughout the 90 please don't hold back <laughs> uh future be metal artist. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, cool question. Well, I've got a couple of stories. I I didn't – my experience was minimal. They wouldn't have fucked with you, Adelaida. They wouldn't dare, yeah. surely. No. I, I, do, I had – as I said, I, I had minimal experience with sexual harassment. Um, my peers and my band and a lot of people that I worked with were really good guys, respectful – and would always stand up for any kind of harassment, um, including against women. So, and a lot of boys I hung out with were very in touch with their feminine side. Um, I'm not making any judgments here. Sorry, I don't mean to come across that way. But d- yeah, so they were um, well-rounded human beings. Well, yeah, they weren't very machismo-like in that way. Um, but um, look, uh, yeah, I didn't really get fucked with that. I, that much I think because I have quite a fiery nature in that way but I definitely experienced some horrible moments um and I I can count them on one hand I think it was even two times maybe three no two times I can remember um but I think in the crowd the the first line of harassment was from the punters there would be the odd yobbo whatever yelling out something you know, show us you whatever, you know. So, of course, I'd be like, get the fuck out of this room, kick that person out, whatever. So I'd really make a big mm. song and dance about it. I'd really call them out really big time. 
it makes me really angry, so I just react. I get very European like that. I'm just like, ah! So that was fine. And the crowd, you know, they'd love it. They'd be like, yay, yay! You know, so everyone's behind you. And uh, But there were two times I remember I came out into the crowd and a guy decided to tell me he liked my show by putting his hand on my bum. So I went like that and I grabbed his neck and I shoved him against the wall and I said, don't touch me. <laughs> so I don't like, I don't, I kind of have my knee jerk reactions like it's, don't. It's a line in your song, you touch me, I'll kill you. Yeah, I just don't <laughs> like being my personal space being invaded but then on top of that being touched like that. And then I remember there was one time in, at a venue in Tassie, um, the venue's great, audience is great. Love this venue, love everything about it. But, you know, you get your bad eggs and this one guy, he decided to put his hand up my crotch. I went out in the crowd because I like going out in the crowds. I like, uh, you know, <coughs> my guitar out there and venturing out and he decided to put his hand up my crotch and I lost it. I absolutely lost it. I'm furious and I, I actually the whole... I actually had to get five guys to hold me back because I was going to kill him. Like I, they knew I was going to kill him because once my primal animal thing is triggered, oh, I get in a white hot rage. Like I can't see anything. Like you know when you get yeah. so rage filled oh, yeah. oh, yeah. that you just want to kill. So I wanted to kill him, and I never quite got there. So oh, God. <laughs> it makes me furious to this day. And if he was in this room right now, I'd probably go to kill him again. Um, so don't fucking touch me, all right? Don't fucking touch me. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> uh, see? Yes. That's what happens. <laughs> don't touch anyone for that matter. What happened to the first guitar you learnt to play on that your mum bought you at Greville Street? Oh, yeah, no, that's long gone, the all acoustic. Right. But I do still have the very first electric guitar. It was an S... It was an Ibanez SG copy and I bought it in a music shop in Geelong and I've still got it and it was the, still the best guitar I've ever had still to this day. The pickup's amazing, P90s. Whew. Beautiful guitar. Yeah. Quite quite uh, a historical piece of magic dirt memorabilia. Yes. Well, this brings me to my next question from my lovely neighbour, Dan Pollard. Curious as to know why you've been so faithful to the humble Gibson SG guitar all these years. Yeah, I've tried other guitars, but the SG is a beautiful slim shape. I like the two horns. Um, it's got low action. And the P90s or the P94s are my favourite um, pickups. And the neck is, depending on the neck you get, but a lot of them are fast and slim and I like that. I've tried Fenders. I actually do have a Fender Jazzmaster, which is modelled on Lee Ronaldo's custom. Wow. Yeah, jazz. So I've got that and that's actually quite good for lead work. But, yeah, I just can't go past the Gibson SG. Les Pauls are too heavy. I don't like Strats. Sorry. I know people like Strats but I just can't warm to them. It's a personal choice. Yeah, yeah. it is. It's a personal thing. But, yeah, as soon as I saw that two-horned, two two, you know, beast in the shop, I just went, I want that one. <laughs> I had no idea that, you know, um, Angus – it's Angus Young, isn't it? Yeah, from Akadaka played <laughs> – played one of those yeah so I just saw it I like yeah. the look of it and yeah. um yeah it was really good so yeah have you ever, have you ever, ever had uh like a a sponsorship from Gibson at all nope well it's high bloody time <laughs> they uh they sponsored you no nah, it's all right I don't like favors <laughs> I don't like being sponsored nah it's all right yeah but thanks. oh you're still salt of the earth oh aren't you Adelita uh, salt of the earth nah, right. feet grounded no nah, I just don't like no nah, don't want to do it now, Tony Evans, still a guitar nerd question. Uh, on the pickups in your Greco SG, what are they? What What are the guitar nerd questions on the pickups in her Greco SG? Because it sounds fucking killer. Greco, I never had a Greco. Um, it, uh, it's an Ibanez SG. Um, the pickups, they were just P90s of some sort. And um, I did sub them out. I swapped them into another SG. But So now I don't actually know where those Ibanez pickups are. But I'll have to ask Rao. <laughs> he knows he's the guitar nerd, so he knows where they are. But I think they were just P90s, but they were beautiful. Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> I like this one. Jolan Lata, sorry if I've pronounced your name wrong. Have you ever been asked to sit for a portrait for entry in the Archibald Prize? Yes, I have a few times, yes. And you've said no each time? Um, or have you Yeah, sat? pretty much. I haven't, yeah, yeah, I've. 
I've said no a lot. Um, I did sit for one many, many years ago for a triptych, um, which was pretty cool. So mm. there is one out there mm. of me, but that's the only one. But I have been asked a fair bit. Yeah. Why, why have you been reticent to do it? Um, I've just been really busy a lot of the time when people do ask. And um, I don't know. I think you just have to, I don't know. I just kind of have a, a intuition about certain things. So I just go with things that I feel connected to. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the next one's from Dom Byrne, who says, when do you plan to bring back the classic one-piece bathers with jeans over the top look? Maybe at a gig or more low-key, perhaps, like when you're doing a spot of gardening. <laughs> oh, good on you, Dom. <laughs> who asked that? Dom Byrne. Dom Byrne, I love that question. <laughs> I've been waiting for that question all my life. <laughs> I love that look. I actually was thinking about that look the other day and how much I'd love to do it again. I just have to get super fit to bring that back. Because <laughs> it's such a great look. Like, I don't know why no one's doing it now. Like, I remember these bathers, sort of a bit silvery and then jeans over the yeah, top. So it's yeah. sort of like a leotard yeah. with jeans over Hard the top. Hard to go to the toilet, though. You've got to derobe yourself. Yeah, well, you know, there's ways. Yeah, yeah, true, <laughs> true. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, I would love to bring that back. I'll, I'm going to... I'm going to file that self, note friend. to self, file yeah. away. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, cool. All right. And our final question today, Adelita, is I love her. That's not a question. That's a statement, <laughs> Maria. I'm interested to know who are her most influential and favourite musicians. Who does she admire? What are her views of the Riot Girl movement of the 90s? This is three questions, Maria. And everything she does is great and magic dirt legendary that's another statement but it's a true statement thank you very much maria which one would you like Aww. to answer first <laughs> oh that's very nice maria thank you you're very generous with your comments um i'll just answer the influences mm -hmm. um first brain um I'll, i love a lot of music it's a tough question because yeah my old brain can't Get answers out quick. But um, the obvious ones are Kate Bush is a massive, massive influence and I love her music so much. She really influenced me from a very young age, like um, in my teenage years. I felt very uh, safe and aligned with her music and she kind of um, articulated a lot of stuff that I felt like – I felt like she was really unique and I felt like I was a bit like – weird or a bit outside of the norms of society so her music really kind of reflected that part of myself just that weirdness and that I don't know she was really magical in that way I just really gravitated to her music and just felt like she was a kindred spirit um and then oh my god so much <laughs> music it's ridiculous like so much I'll have to do a list somewhere one day of just uh, I'll do some playlists or something like that um, but, yeah, I would say Kate Bush is one of the very main, very important ones for me. Um, and what are your views of the Riot Girl movement of the 90s? Now, that was the movement with Bikini Kill. Kathleen Hanna was really instrumental in that and uh, kind of filtered onto Hole and all the other, other bands. Um, do you have uh, much of a reflection? Was that influential to you? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I used to wear a lot of feminist T-shirts and... I felt very empowered by that movement and, you know, I felt the same, like sort of angry and like speaking out, standing up, um, you know, I'm a chick, I'm playing music, so what, get over it, we're tough, we're powerful, we'll do what we want, you know, um, standing up, you know, and um, yeah, I listened to, you know, I loved um, Bikini Kill but I loved Babes in Toyland, oh, they were yeah. one of my favourite, favourite bands of, um, yeah, that time and that sort of movement but yeah, you know. Yeah, that was a huge part of it, you know. And, you know, even people like Kurt Cobain who, you know, he was a really strong feminist mm. as well. So there was a lot of us, you know, that it wasn't just about feminism. It, it was about, um, not, you know, not being treated like shit just because mm. of who you were or what you were doing kind of thing, you know, just basic human rights, you know. Um, yeah, so that was huge and we loved that music. And I wrote a piece for a book um, oh, I can't remember what it's called, but it was a, a feminist, sort of a right girl uh, manifesto and I wrote an article for that that's in this book. I'll try and remember it and post it somewhere. Um, but, yeah, yeah, right girl was awesome. I'm going to finish the interview, Adelita, with 
I really want to know from you, what's the motto you live by? Do you have a, a statement or yeah. adage or a motto that you, you, you live by? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I guess what I was saying before where I try and follow my heart, so I try to get clear on what it is I need to do next and to get to that place I have to relax and I have to just sort of go about my life and and sort of and then the next thing will come. Um, I just go on feelings. I sort of go on feelings. So if something doesn't feel right, I'm like, okay, I don't want to do that. Um, so I guess if so, sort of doing the right thing. Sounds doing like trusting right your thing. gut. Yeah, the trusting the gut. Yeah. That That's kind of my motto. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I've found in my life, which is a bit harder to do now because I'm aware of it, but I've found in my life if I just follow my nose and just like – it's like what Joseph Campbell said, that, that famous m- mythologist and writer. He said something like, follow your bliss. I know it sounds really, you know, you know, sort of daggy or whatever, but follow your bliss. Like just do what makes you excited. Like do what makes you passionate. Do what you sort of, you know, like and then that will lead to something because that's exactly what happened to me is I just played that guitar, that acoustic guitar. Someone learned guitar or... Or I followed that guy to Melbourne, which <laughs> led to me meeting someone else, which led to Magic Dirt continuing. You know, all this mm. other, that sort of all those connections. Like if you follow something with glee, mm. um, it usually will lead to something really good. That's what's happened to me. So I try to do that now, but I'm more aware of it. So now I'm like, oh, well, <laughs> what is it I have to follow? I don't know. Or, you know, I get doubtful, I second guess, you know. But So, yeah, just following your heart and staying true kind of thing. Yeah, that's kind of what I live by. I love it. Mm. Adelita, it's been absolutely joyous <laughs> sitting with you here yeah. for the last hour. Thank you so much for your time. Thank I've you, I've learned Jane. a lot and uh, <laughs> it's been brilliant. Thank you. Oh, you've been brilliant too. <laughs> You're awesome. Thanks, Jane. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thanks for your questions.